Welcome to Toyota Time with Timmy the Toolman and Sean and returning special guest Jordan. And what we're going to do today is we're going to do an addendum to the manual hub swap. On my 98 Forerunner, I decided to do the manual hub swap. And the reason why I decided it would be worthwhile is for a few reasons. With a regular ADD system, an automatic differential disconnect system, your CV axles are turning all the time, whether you like it or not. The reason why they're turning all the time is the way they connect to the knuckle. Here's one of my Toyota 4Runner CV axles. This is the side that goes into the differential, and this is the side that goes into the knuckle. The reason why it's turning all the time is because this spline goes into the hub, and then this lock nut goes on the outside and locks the whole assembly together. And the high torque spec of this nut is what's preloading the bearing so the bearing is going to be working properly on your rig and it's not going to fail. For this reason, when the wheel's turning, the CV axle's turning and it's basically turning all the time. So when you have a lifted truck, your CV angles are going to be at a more extreme angle. When they're at a more extreme angle, the joints are going to wear out quicker and you're going to go through more CV axles. Also, when you have a more extreme angle, the CV boot ribs could be rubbing together and you could have a premature failure of the boot ribs. You could do an extended boot stretch mod like we've actually shown a video of to combat having a boot prematurely rip on you. But you can't really do anything to prevent your CV axles wearing out quicker when you lift your truck with an ADD system because the axles are turning all the time. So with manual hubs, you're only going to be turning your CV axles when you lock the hubs. When you lock the hubs, you're locking the CV axle to the hub, and then when the wheel is turning, the CV axle is turning. So you can extend the life of your CV axles by doing this modification because the CV axles are only going to be receiving wear when you lock the hubs so they will be turning with the wheels. So that's the first benefit. The next benefit that I think is probably the biggest benefit is the fact that if you're out four wheeling and you break an axle, if you have a regular ADD system, when you break that axle, you are forced to fix it on the trail. You don't have a choice because the axles always are turning with the wheel. So you can't just say, well, I'll just fix that when it's convenient. You are forced to get your tools out and fix that axle on the trail. With a manual hub system, if you can get out in two wheel drive, you could just unlock the hubs and then you could fix that CV axle whenever you feel like it, whenever's convenient. So that's a big one because depending on where you're at, it might be really bad to be doing a trail repair in a situation where the truck's not very stable or possibly you've missed bringing an essential tool and now you're stuck out there. It is fairly common for independent front suspension trucks when they get into the right situation to break a CV axle. So that was the big one for me that I can actually get out of a tricky situation and I could fix the rig at a spot where it's much more convenient. The third benefit that I see to this modification is you get an additional option with your gearing. What I noticed when I was doing some four wheeling with my buddy Jordan, who's helping me today, is that when you're doing sustained climbs, you can significantly drop your transmission temperatures on your automatic transmission if you're running in four low as opposed to four high. Say for instance, you're climbing a really steep paved road and you see your transmission temperatures going through the roof. Well, you can pull over, you can put your transfer case into four low and not have your front hubs locked and now you could use the gearing from your transfer case to help you get up that steep mountain road and still be able to turn and not bind your front wheels because they say you're not supposed to be putting your rig and four wheel drive on pavement right unless it's snowy or icy but in this situation with uh, manual hubs you can unlock the hubs put it in four low and now crawl up that steep road and not overheat your automatic transmission. So that's the third benefit that I see with this modification. What we didn't cover in the first video with Jordan is 
there's different levels of how you can do this job. Say for instance, you're like Jordan and you don't have ABS on your rig. Your rig came without ABS. Well, you can take those first gen Tacoma knuckles with the manual hubs and as long as you think that the bearings are still in good shape, you can just take your Toyota 4Runner knuckles off with the ADD system and you can slap those manual Tacoma knuckles on with the Tacoma CV axles that are specific for manual hubs and the job will only cost you as much as you paid for those used Tacoma manual hub knuckles and the manual hub CV axles. The reason why Jordan did the press work and replaced his bearings and the, all the seals and all the associated parts was because his knuckles didn't come with dust shields. The guy he bought it off of eBay, the dust shields were rusted and not on there. So he was forced to drive the hub out of the knuckle so he can put new dust shields in. So that's why he did that. So if you're lucky and you get a pair of Tacoma knuckles with good dust shields and good bearings and everything looks good, you can save yourself some money on this modification. The next level of this modification and expense is you take the Tacoma knuckles like I'm doing and you swap over the parts to either your Tacoma knuckles with an ABS port or your Forerunner knuckles with an ABS port because you want to retain ABS function. And that's exactly what I'm doing in this video today is I'm going to swap over the parts to my Forerunner knuckles so I can retain ABS function. I also went to the next level and I decided that since the CV axles are already out, I bought reboot kits. The reboot kits for the Tacoma CV axles, I think are about 40 bucks a piece I paid. That's an additional expense. But since you know that these CV axles came off of a manual hub vehicle, the chances are those CV axle boots are probably in decent shape and you may be able to get away without rebooting them. But I figured since they're already out of the vehicle, it was a smart time to reboot them. So for the job I'm doing today, here's what I invested into this mod. I got the used Tacoma knuckles and the CV axles for 400 bucks. The guy who sold me the knuckles and CV axles also threw in the front differential that I really didn't need so maybe I can make some money selling that in the future if I choose. The $300 to $400 range is right in that range of what you're gonna pay for a used set of Tacoma manual hub knuckles and the CV axles that go with it. The rest of the parts cost me about 400 bucks. That's new OEM Koyo bearings, new inner and outer dust seals, new gaskets for the manual hubs, new snap ring, and some wheel bearing grease I had to buy for this application. You can expect to pay anywhere from $300 to $400 if you're just gonna not worry about having ABS or you don't need ABS or you can go all the way that I did with rebooting the CV axles, renewing all the parts, which would cost you probably in the neighborhood of $800. The purpose of this video is I wanted to show you the differences from Jordan's application and my application. Because I'm swapping over the parts to my Forerunner knuckles that have an ABS port, there's gonna be some differences in the parts that go into the knuckle. Instead of the spacer that Jordan used that went in between the bearing and the lock nut, I'm gonna substitute in the ABS tone ring so I retain ABS function. This video will benefit third generation Toyota 4Runner owners and first generation Tacoma owners in two ways. Number one, if they're gonna do the job exactly like I'm doing, they're gonna swap over Tacoma manual hub parts over to their knuckles that have ABS ports, they're gonna see how to do the job exactly the way I'm doing it. Number two, say for instance, you don't care about a manual hub swap, but you have bad wheel bearings and you need to replace them. This video is gonna show the involved press work on ADD knuckles that we weren't able to show in the first video because Jordan just used the Tacoma manual hub knuckles. We never showed anything in regards to the Forerunner or Tacoma ADD ABS knuckles because we just swapped them out. We didn't do any press work. You'll be able to see the involved press work so you can get your wheel bearings replaced correctly and then back on your rig. So those are the two main purposes of this video. 
Because in the first video, we show you all the intricate detail of the manual hubs and getting the knuckles off the rig and back on the rig, we're not gonna show any of that. If you need that detail of knowing how the manual hubs work, knowing how to get the knuckles on and off your rig, click on the link above and you can see all the detail you'll need to get that part of the job done. Also, that video description is going to have all the part numbers, it's going to have all the torque specs, everything you need. It's already in that first manual hub swap video. With all that said, let's get started on this job. The first thing we're going to do on both knuckles is we're going to remove these 12 millimeter bolts that hold the backing plate on. There's four of them. And the reason why we're doing that is when we lay this onto the Harbor Freight press, onto some press plates, we're going to be laying it right in this area and we don't want the force uneven hitting one of the bolt heads we want a nice flat surface to be pressing against so we're going to get these out just a small 12 millimeter bolt they shouldn't be that tight just do the same thing with the other three if you watched our first manual hub swap video the first thing we did is we removed this inner seal i was able to get the arms of my otc puller underneath the inside edge of the seal on both sides. Well, with these ADD knuckles, the bearing spacer here is in the way of fitting the arm in. So we're gonna do it a different way. There's a tiny little lip on the outside of the seal, and I'm hoping we can grab onto it from the backside and get it off. So you could either hook it on the very edge or maybe right on the furthest most point back which I think might be the better way and we're going to pull it off in that fashion instead of from the inside. I adjusted the jaws to where it's grabbing really tight on the outside edges of the seal. Jordan is holding the puller. He's going to slide hammer it off. Bada boom, bada boom. And there it is. The seal's off. So let's talk about some of the anatomy of these ADD knuckles. This part right here, this is what they call the bearing spacer. And what is gonna take the place of this bearing spacer is this threaded lock ring. So we're no longer gonna use the bearing spacer for the manual hubs, we're gonna use the lock ring because this is what preloads the bearing, the one that we have to tighten to a really high torque spec. If you look further down, you'll see this serrated gear. That's the ABS tone ring. That actually slides over the hub and it has a little bit of thickness to it. On the manual hubs, they utilize a spacer instead. So on Jordan's application, he utilized this spacer because he didn't have ABS function. When I swap over the Tacoma parts onto these Forerunner knuckles, I'm gonna utilize the ABS tone ring so I can have ABS function. Those are the differences that we wanted to show you. If you remember from the first video, this is the manual hub spindle. This is the brass bushing that sits in there that keeps the needle bearing in place. We had to select a press sleeve that fit over the brass bushing because we didn't want the force of the press pushed up against the soft brass material. We wanted to contact the steel of the hub body. So we found one that fit over the brass bushing but still contacted the spindle hub. The problem with this is that the diameter of this would allow it to get stuck in the bearing but it wasn't a huge deal i just grabbed the thinner press sleeve and then pressed it out the other way to free the press sleeve of the bearing the add knuckle it's going to be a little bit easier for us because we can select a press sleeve that's going to fit the inner diameter of this bearing spacer and still contact the hub spindle really nicely the nice thing about being able to use a press sleeve that has a smaller diameter is that when it's going through the bearing, it's not going to get stuck. It has a lot of play here. This is going to save us a step from pressing the original press sleeve out of the bearing that gets stuck. So now we're going to go to the press and start doing the press work. We have the press set up just like we did in the first video. On the very bottom, on the cross members of the press, we have a one inch steel plate. On top of the one inch steel plate, we have a four by six up on end. Then on top, we have a half inch steel plate. We have another two one inch steel plates supporting the knuckle. The reason for the four by six is on end is we want to have that distance to give the hub room to travel out of the knuckle. The press sleeve I just got done talking about is going to press the hub 
out of the bearing and then we have this plate that comes with my press sleeve kit to drive against. This is a Harbor Freight 20 ton press. You might be able to do this with a 12 ton press, but I don't know if it would be strong enough to get the hub out of the bearing because it takes quite a bit of force to break free the hub from the bearing. So here we go. That was too easy, you must be doing something wrong. <laughs> The hub luckily pressed out clean. I'll pull it out from underneath here. The press sleeve just fell right through, which is good. It's not stuck in the bearing. This is the ADD hub. Comparing it to the manual hub, you see that this one has threads. This one doesn't. So now with the hub out of the knuckle, you could just pick this up. Your brake dust shield is now off the knuckle. We also got some other things free. The bearing spacer is now free. And then we can pull out the ABS tone ring. So you want to pay attention how these things go together. If you look at this bearing spacer, it's got a beveled or chamfered end. The beveled or chamfered edge faces the differential or the CV axle and the non chamfered end faces the bearing or the ABS tone ring. Remember that if you're doing this job and you're not doing a manual hub swap, you're just doing this to replace bad wheel bearings. This ABS tone ring, the open face side, the concave side faces up and this side, the flat side faces the bearing. So now with these two pieces out of the way, you can see the bearing and you can see how it was installed. This is one of the bearings that I pulled out of the Tacoma knuckle. This black ring right here, the black side, faces the ABS tone ring. So this fully silver colored side faces the wheel or faces the hub and the black side again faces the CV axle or the differential. The next thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna apply a little bit of pressure on the bearing back the way it comes in because in our experience, when you press the hub out, the bearing gets pushed against the snap ring, which is underneath this dust shield. In the first video, we noticed that we had a little bit of difficulty getting the snap ring out. So we actually had to hammer on the face of the bearing to knock it back enough to get the snap ring out of its groove. So we're just gonna apply a little bit of pressure back in the way it goes in till we get resistance and that's good right there. So now hopefully we're gonna have an easier time getting the snap ring off once we get this dust seal off. Now with the OTC puller, we're gonna remove this outer seal so we can get at the snap ring and then finally get the bearing out. We're just using two jaws and Jordan's gonna slide hammer it off. And there's the seal off and here's the snap ring that we have to get off next. We did a test of trying to move the snap ring and it's really locked in there and you can't really see it in the video, but it's distorted. It's kind of pushed up, showing that there's pressure against it. If you don't have what we have, we have an old bearing with the bearings removed and this works as an excellent press sleeve for pressing. If you didn't have one of these, then maybe what you can do is support the knuckle like we're doing, and then maybe take a brass drift and hammer it and try to knock it back a little bit so you can get the snap ring out easier because right now it's loaded up and it's gonna fight you. We're using the bearing outer race, and then I just have this half inch steel plate and I'm gonna put it on top. I'm just gonna drive this down till I meet some significant resistance and letting me know that the bearing has pushed itself all the way back down to its fully seated position, taking pressure off that snap ring. Oh, okay. Yeah, I saw it move about a sixteenth of an inch. Jordan saw it move and I'm now feeling significant resistance letting me know that the bearing's back to its fully seated position and we should expect that the snap ring is now going to be easier to get out. So utilize some snap ring pliers. I, I did a test grab and it's starting to move. It's still a little bit loaded up and I think that's just because the snap ring got a little distorted. 
So you might find the same thing, but if you can get one side out, then you could probably work it out the rest of the way. Now that I got a little gap, I'm gonna use a screwdriver and then try to work it out the rest of the way. Now maybe I'll grab it with a, well, I could just work it out with my hands. There it is. One thing that I noticed on the Tacoma Knuckles, one of the bearings was obviously replaced by a shop or a previous owner. And what they did is they broke these ears off or they broke off one side. And when I was trying to pry out the other side, the other side broke. With these ears broken off, it makes it a lot harder to get this snap ring out. I had to get a sharp pick tool underneath and utilizing another person's extra set of hands to pry this thing out. So do your level best to not break these ends off because you're gonna be able to get the snap ring out much easier with the ears in place. Some people might be inclined to save money and use this again. I wouldn't recommend it because you've put some force on it driving the hub out. Maybe these ears are gonna break on you when you try to reassemble it. And then if you ever have to do the job again, it's gonna make it hard to get it out. So go ahead and spend the extra money and get some new snap rings for this application. Now with the snap ring out of the way, there's nothing holding the bearing back and we can press the bearing out this direction. I'm utilizing the biggest press sleeve that I have on the press sleeve kit. And then again, I'm using the round adapter that comes with the kit. You'll notice when doing this that the bearing is usually a lot easier to get out than it is to drive the hub through the bearing. Getting the bearing out of the knuckle takes a lot less force than it does to get the hub out of the bearing. And there it is. Everything is now pressed out of the knuckle and here's our bearing. So now it's time to put everything back together. This is a brand new coil OEM bearing. And like we saw, the bearing has two distinct sides. This black ring side, and then the old silver side with the signs of a little rubber seal on the very outer edge there. So the way this bearing went into the knuckle is the black side went in like so. So facing the CV axle and the all silver side faces the side with the metal snap ring. Make sure you keep the same orientation. We're not 100% sure it really makes a huge difference, but since this is the orientation that the bearings were in, and these are most likely OEM bearings, my truck only has 135,000 miles on it, I doubt the wheel bearings have ever been messed with. So I'm just gonna take some high temperature disc brake wheel bearing grease and I'm gonna coat the bearing a little bit, put a little bit on the inside the diameter of the knuckle and then get ready to press it in. The reason for the grease is that this is just gonna make it a lot easier for the bearing to slide into the knuckle. It just breaks down the surface friction. Okay, we're just gonna set the bearing on here like so. So we have the press set up just like we did before to do the press work. We're still utilizing the two press plates with a four by six sandwiched in between. And we're just using one crossbar to support the knuckle. We're gonna start off by just putting a half inch plate over the top of the bearing to press it down to where the press plate is flush with the knuckle. Once it's driven in that far with the press plate, then we're gonna drive it the rest of the way in. And we found that the old bearing race works as a good press plate because it's the perfect diameter of the old bearing. And it's gonna put the pressure on the outer race, not on the inner race. You don't wanna be putting pressure on the inner race to drive it in. You wanna be putting pressure on the outer race. Now, ideally, you want the bearing going in as straight as possible. As you press it, if it's a little crooked, it's gonna self-correct, but it's just gonna make the press work a little bit easier if you start with the bearing fairly square with the knuckle, not kind of cocked in the opening, but actually fitting pretty darn even. Now I'm gonna be driving down force on the plate and it's gonna push the bearing in as far as the plate will hit the top of the knuckle. Yeah, 
Let's say we can stop it there. Perfect. So this is as far as we can go with the metal plate. Now we're gonna back off the press and we're gonna use the bearing race to drive it in all the way. So now we have the bearing race of one of the old bearings on top of the new bearing. We're gonna put the same half inch steel plate on top. And then now this old bearing race is gonna be our press sleeve to press it all the way to its fully seated position. There was a little bit of resistance at the very end, but when you feel significant resistance, you know that the bearing is fully bottomed out and now you can release. As a double check to make sure that the bearing's fully seated, is you'll now be able to see the groove where the snap ring goes into. So if that's fully visible, then you definitely have the bearing fully seated. So now we're gonna get the snap ring in place. I'm gonna get it started on one edge and then kind of work it in with my hand. So if you get one end in there and then just kind of bend it in place, you could feed it in most of the way with your hand, just like that. Wow. Pretty easy. No tools necessary. I didn't have to okay. squeeze it with snap ring pliers. I was able to feed it in just with my hand. We're now gonna get a new outer seal in place. I'm just gonna put a little bit of the same bearing grease on here. Then we're gonna put, obviously, the concave side has to fit this direction. Try to get it on as square as possible. Now we're just gonna use a brass drift and a hammer and we're gonna tap it in place. So you just wanna be kind of methodical. Hit it a little bit on one side, then a little bit on the other side. Once you get it going, then it's easier, but your first hits, it might wanna rock a little bit on you. So if you have an extra set of hands, somebody pushing counter pressure while you knock it down on the opposite side, it was helpful. So now we've got it started and then you just want to knock it evenly whatever side is high you want to hit that side and get it going pretty square down when the seal is fully seated there's still a little bit of a gap here on the knuckle it looks like you might be tricked into thinking that it's supposed to go all the way down to this little bevel here but you'll hear a difference in the sound as you're tapping this it'll go from sounding a little more hollow to sounding solid so you work your way around getting that solid feel another indicator is you can look at where the inner seal lip comes in contact with the snap ring and if it's contacting the snap ring around the full circumference you know you've gotten it fully seated do yourself a favor and don't forget to put your brake dust shield on first before we drive the hub through the bearing. If your sticker is still intact, the one that says M36, that's for the right knuckle. And then if you clean it off enough, there actually is a little R right there, yeah. letting you know that this goes with the right one. And this one has a little L. There's a, there's a little L right yeah. there. I don't know if you could see it in the, in the video. And the left one is labeled H36. So this is the side that faces the wheel. So this concave side faces upward. So Jordan is just getting the 12 millimeter nuts all started and we're gonna cinch them up. We don't have a torque spec for this because I'm really not that worried about it. We're just gonna get them nice and tight. If you watched our first video, Jordan and I made the error of not supporting the inner race while we drove the hub through the top. Grab a press sleeve or a piece of pipe, whatever you have, and you wanna support this inner race and be supporting it, but have a big enough inner diameter so the hub spindle can go through. This one in my kit is gonna support the inner race really well, but it still allow the spindle of the hub to drive through it. I'm gonna use some of the same bearing grease and lubricate the inner race of the bearing. And then I'm gonna lubricate the shaft of the hub. Again, this grease is just gonna make it easier for the two parts to come together. It's just gonna break down the surface tension. This seal here actually rides against this surface. It's really just a dust seal, but we can put a light coating of grease here too, since we're gonna be jamming those two faces together. 
Now we're gonna bring all this back to the press. We now have a press sleeve that's supporting the inner race of the bearing. And so as the hub is driving force on the other side, on the top side of that inner race, you're not putting any pressure on the bearings in there because the inner race is supported right now. When we did it last time, we didn't have anything supporting the inner race and we potentially could have messed up the bearing, but we lucked out and we didn't actually mess up the bearing. But this is the correct way you should do it. A press sleeve supporting the inner race while you're driving the hub down through the top. Now on the very top, we have another press sleeve that's fitting this inner diameter of the hub really nicely. And then again, we have another one of the press plates that come with the kit to drive downward. There we go. We got, got motion, happy motion. I think that's it. Yep, yep, the seal has contacted. Good, it's done. Like Jordan just said, when you see the seal, the rubber seal hit the body of the hub, you know you're done. You also know you're done. You feel significant force. You feel like it loads up and it's not going anywhere. That lets you know that the hub is fully seated in the bearing and you're done with the press work. Here's the difference in applications. Because I have ABS, instead of using this spacer, I'm gonna use the ABS tone ring in its position. And if you hold up the two parts together, it does look like this spacer is a tiny bit wider, but the nut is still gonna be able to tighten down properly, so it's not a big deal. If you had non-ABS knuckles, you'd be dropping the spacer in. For me, I'm gonna be dropping the ABS tone ring in with the open side facing up. I'm just gonna put a little bit of bearing grease on this face that faces the bearing and then I'm gonna drop it in place. So now let's pretend that you're just doing this on a Tacoma or Forerunner with ADD knuckles and you're gonna be using the ADD hubs. Test fitting this ABS tone ring, it just slides over and drops in place. It's not even a press fit at all. So that's fully seated. Now this bearing spacer on the other hand, this fits sort of tight. Whether you just take a press plate or a piece of pipe and you just knock it down into position, or maybe you use your press to do it. I can't really show it because this is not the application, but I'm sure you could figure it out. Like I said, knock it down evenly with a press lever, just tap it with a brass hammer, or maybe utilize your press and press it into position. I'm gonna put some bearing grease on the threads of the lock ring. I'm gonna put a little bit on the threads on here too. And I'm gonna put some grease on the face of the ABS tone ring facing the lock nut. And now I'm just gonna screw it on. This four pin lock nut tool, it's made by OEM tools and it's made specifically for this application. So you just push it down the four pins into the four holes and then I could just hand tighten this. And now that's hand tight. The next thing we have to do is we have to torque this to spec. We show this in a lot of detail in the first manual hub swap video. We are utilizing a spare tire with one of the Toyota rotors and we have a couple lug nuts bolting the whole assembly together. And then we take our special tool, we put that down and we get a big torque wrench. The torque spec for that lock nut is 203 foot-pounds. It's really helpful to have an extra set of hands. The tool has the tendency to want to rock out of the pins. So by me keeping pressure downward, it's going to hold the special tool into the lock nut while Jordan brings it up to the torque spec of 203 foot-pounds. We got it torqued to 203 foot-pounds and then now you have to indent the lock ring into this little hole right here. This is a protective measure so the lock ring can't back off on itself. So by knocking this edge inward in this relief cut in the hub body, this makes it so where the thing can't back off. So I'm just gonna use a punch with a hammer to knock it in. Now 
There we go. The final thing that we need to do is we need to get this inner seal in place and it faces this direction. This side faces towards the CV axle. This side drives into the hub towards the lock nut. So I'm just gonna put a little grease on the outside to help it knock in easier. And then I'm gonna put a little grease on the inside here too. I'm gonna set this on top. Get it again as square as possible before you start driving it in. What we noted last time is that this outer bearing race works as a great press leave for this seal because it fits in nicely to the outer diameter where we want to be striking to drive this thing in. And then we'll just again use this half inch plate that I have to hit against. So looking at which side is high, I can see this side right here is high, so I'm gonna strike here first. And then just drive it in equally. And when the grease squishes out, you know you're done. <laughs> Looks good. <laughs> All right, we are done with this job. I now have manual hubs on my 98 Toyota 4Runner. And I'm part of the Cool Kids Club now with my manual hubs. Everybody's going to be drooling over them as I'm negotiating the speed bumps at the mall. The job is pretty straightforward. It's the same as the first video, with the exception that we're swapping out different parts. Instead of the spacer, or basically a big thick washer, we put in its place the ABS tone ring so I would have ABS function still. Instead of this bearing spacer, we put in its place the lock ring that preloads the bearing on a manual hub system. Also with this video, you got to see what it would take to replace your wheel bearings if that's all you wanted to do. You're not doing a manual hub swap. You just wanted to see how to accomplish the press work to get the old bearing out, get the new bearing back in correctly, replacing all the associated seals and getting it back on your rig. With this video, and the previous video that we linked, you'll be able to accomplish that. The one thing that I didn't show you if you were just doing a wheel bearing replacement on your ADD hubs is how to get this bearing spacer onto the end of the spindle. I'm pretty sure that if you just knocked it down with a brass hammer evenly, it would go down no problem, but I can't say for sure. What I do know for sure is if you get this on your press, Put a little bearing grease on both the surfaces, on the inner surface of the bearing spacer, on the surface of the spindle. You get a press plate or a press sleeve and you press it down. You're gonna be able to get this thing on no problem. If you do do it, please comment and let us know how you did it so you can share that with others wanting to know too how you were able to accomplish that. With all that said, we thank you for watching Toyota Time with Timmy the Toolman and Sean and special guest Jordan. Thank you for watching. Thank you for subscribing. If you have any questions or comments, do that below. Take care. Bye-bye.